On July 4th, 2017, nine-year-old Kayla Unbihan disappeared from her Illinois hometown, South Elgin, along with 40-year-old Heather Unbihan, her mom. She was to return to her father, Ryan Eskirka, 43, the next day on July 5th, as he had permanent custody of Kayla. No one knew where she and her mom had vanished. After Kayla was abducted, her loved ones tirelessly searched for her for years, with the assistance of the neighborhood, until finally, a shocking thing happened. But how did Kayla disappear in the bright daylight? Who was capable of such a horrible deed? South Elgin is a tranquil village tucked away in Kane County, Illinois. It is a welcoming community of over 23,000 people, where everyone knows each other's names and where doors are frequently left open. Living here has a peaceful feel to it that has been strengthened by the influence of the nearby Windy City. The community has both historical and recreational attractions, appealing to both adventure seekers and history lovers. However, a regrettable occurrence in 2017 disturbed its lovely atmosphere. An unexpected incident tarnished the town's low crime rate, a sobering reminder that security can be compromised even in the friendliest environments. Kayla Unbihan was born on July 5th, 2008. To Ryan Eskirka and Heather Unbihan in the western suburbs of Chicago. As time passed, the couple separated as life took its course. A judge made the decision that Kayla's father would be given full custody of the child. In Kayla's life, this judicial ruling opened a significant new chapter. Family ties continued after the split since Heather was permitted to visit her daughter on some weekends. The approaching of July 4th in 2017 offered the promise of festivity. Kayla was to spend the holiday with her mother and was to return to her father Ryan the next day. Little did Ryan know what was about to happen would change the years to come. The morning of July 5th brought a heartbreaking turn. Kayla was supposed to return to her father, Ryan Eskirka, on the 5th of July, her birthday. A day that ought to have been filled with joy and love ended up going in an unexpected direction. The joyful anticipation of a father's embrace was replaced by a desperate search when Kayla went missing. As he arrived at Heather's house as planned, Ryan Eskirka's excitement could be felt. After a weekend of leaving his child in her mother's care, he was excited to see her for her birthday. But when he got there, it became clear that both Heather and Kayla were noticeably absent, which worried Ryan. As the unsettling puzzle pieces accumulated, Mr. Eskirka made the key decision to file an official missing persons report out of a growing anxiety and a desire to learn the truth and find his daughter, Kayla. It was later revealed by Heather's family member that Heather had said she was taking her daughter for a camping trip in Wisconsin. Ryan was alarmed by their sudden departure and despite his best efforts, was unable to get in touch with either of them. He contacted the authorities right away to start a search for his missing daughter. Since he was terrified for the worst, and realized how urgent the situation was. Kayla was last seen in Wheaton, Illinois during a parade on the 4th while she was being watched by her mother. Mr. Eskirka actively requested public support and essential information from July 2017 to May of 2023. He used the GoFundMe platform to make a sincere appeal, stating his desire to raise funds for a specific cause. His goal was clear. The funds would be used to hire a private investigator, as well as cover any further costs associated with the extensive search for Heather and Kayla. 
He also stressed the critical importance of their safety and eventual reunion. Recognizing his family's unwavering commitment to this cause, Heather's phone had been made inactive, and her online profile on social media sites had been deliberately deleted. Her ambiguous declaration that she was leaving on a camping expedition to an unknown location and would return by 7 p.m. on July 5th was only known to a small group of her closest family members. When the events were pieced together, it became clear that Heather had been seen moving her items into her car, according to interviews conducted with her neighbors. Her abrupt disappearance and this activity happened close together. Heather's absence from a court hearing she requested on Friday, June 7th, added to the unsettling story. Her attorney, who was perplexed by what had happened and had been kept in the dark, voiced extreme worry. Uncertainty and unresolved questions were woven throughout the story, creating an unsettling tapestry that created a gloomy picture. After a mother and daughter mysteriously vanished, it threw a shadow over Ryan's life and sparked a community's concerted attempts to solve the mystery. Heather became the subject of a national arrest warrant that authorized her extradition on July 28, 2017. Heather was charged in 2017 with child abduction, a Class 4 felony, after Ryan filed the missing person reports. A judge set her bail at $10,000, and from then onwards, South Elgin police actively pursued multiple leads and tips while collaborating with law enforcement organizations across the nation to try and find the missing girl and Heather. The community on the GoFundMe website responded positively to Ryan's cry for help, and over the period of nearly six years, donations to the GoFundMe campaign reached $2,500, bringing it closer to its $10,000 goal. Days turned into months, and months into years, but there was no sign of the child or the mother. The case of Kayla Unbehun's abduction grew cold over time, as no lead was to be found, until a shocking breakthrough that appeared in 2023. A crucial breakthrough in the search for answers concerning Kayla's disappearance occurred in November of 2022. Her tale grew beyond its initial confines, reaching a wider audience through a well-known streaming site, Netflix. Kayla's presence took center stage in the ninth episode of the third volume of Unsolved Mysteries, a program dedicated to putting light on intriguing stories. Kayla's photograph appeared during the pre credit scene where the faces of missing children were deliberately aged to offer a glimpse into their prospective appearances as teenagers. This brief but critical moment, which juxtaposed a snapshot of a nine-year-old Kayla with a speculative portrayal of her teenage self, lasted only five seconds. The Bring Kayla Home Facebook page, which was created immediately after her disappearance, had continued to be used for organizing and information sharing. The age progression image, which depicted a projection of Kayla's perspective appearance as she grew into her adolescent years, was posted on the site, where it maintained a constant connection with over 7,000 followers. The unrelenting dedication of this online community highlighted the intersection of technology and compassion in the pursuit of solutions. The watershed moment, however, was still to come that would change the course of events. A young girl and woman drew the notice of a vigilant store owner on May 13th at the Westgate Regional Shopping Center in Asheville, North Carolina. This astute observer, though initially uncertain, felt a tugging familiarity that couldn't be denied. Heather Unbehun's face sparked a flash of memory, a link to a narrative 
that had echoed across the country. Then came the heart-stopping realization. The young girl accompanying bore a remarkable similarity to the lost Kayla. Recognizing the gravity of the issue, the store owner made a decisive move. He contacted the authorities as soon as he could. As soon as the information was transmitted to the authorities, the action was taken. According to the APD announcement, officers responded to Plato's Closet at the Westgate Regional Shopping Center approximately 7.26 p.m. May 13th to investigate a suspected kidnapping. When police arrived, they were informed that Kayla had been recognized from the show aired on Netflix. This astute observation triggered a chain reaction that resulted in the arrest of her mother and the long-awaited reunification of Kayla with her father in the heart of the Midwest. This identification led to the arrest of Heather Unbihan on the 13th of May, 2023. After much waiting, Kayla and her father were finally reunited, ushering in a long-needed period of harmony and unity. On the 16th of May, 2023, the Kane County State's Attorney's Office commented on the sequence of events via social media. It described the swift response that occurred after the recognition, emphasizing the coordination between the Asheville Police and their counterparts in South Elgin. This united effort rapidly established the identities of the two people, Heather Unbihun and Kayla, the long-missing child. Jerry Krawchick, chief of police in South Elgin, expressed his gratitude and shared the collective excitement felt by law enforcement agencies and individuals from several states. These people's tireless and determined work resulted in a heartening end. Kayla was in good physical and mental health after being reunited with her father, according to Chief Krawchick. This optimistic report gave detectives and families searching for loved ones who had been missing for extended periods of time hope. Lieutenant Jonathan Brown of the Asheville Police Department was intrigued by the case's distinctiveness. Typically, digital breadcrumbs aid in quick tracking, but Heather Unbihan managed to remain hidden for an extended period of time, defying conventional patterns. Heather Unbihan was facing a felony charge of extradition, which she opted not to cooperate with. As a result, she was released on Tuesday, the 16th of May, after posting a $25,000 bond. Her little taste of freedom, however, was fleeting, as she voluntarily surrendered the next day in Kane County, Illinois. This was a watershed moment in the story as she was officially booked on the accusation of child abduction. Following the judicial proceedings, Heather appeared before Judge Julia Yetter on Thursday, May 18, 2023. This appearance resulted in her being released on bond, conditional on the use of an electronic monitoring device. Kayla's father obtained a protective order against Heather in light of the facts. This order required her to stay at least 1,000 feet away from his home and not leave the state of Illinois without the prior consent of the court. A Kane County State's Attorney's Office representative revealed the specifics of these legal measures. Heather Unbihan appeared in Kane County Court once more to face the child abduction charge. As a result of these procedures, she was released on a $10,000 bail and ordered to wear a GPS tracking monitor to ensure she complied with the imposed restrictions. It is unclear whether she entered a plea or sought legal representation. Meanwhile, Ryan demanded seclusion in the midst of legal proceedings and familial difficulties. This request for personal space came while he was rekindling his bond with his daughter Kayla. Despite the legal proceedings and emotional complications, the road of rebuilding and reconnecting remained at the forefront, 
marking an important turn in the ongoing struggle. In retrospect, this path of tenacity was marked by important turning points. The convergence of Kayla's story and a globally accessible streaming platform was the turning point. The reach of technology propelled her story to the forefront of public consciousness. The ripple effect of this exposure led to Kayla's reconciliation with her father and the solving of the mystery surrounding her absence. The episode featuring Kayla Unbehun is found in the ninth episode of Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 3 on Netflix, aptly named Abducted by a Parent. This episode marks the resolution of the once baffling mystery. As Kayla's recovery after six years brings closure. Despite the extended duration of her absence, the news of her discovery and apparent well-being remains heartening. Her father Ryan expressed his joy and relief in a statement released by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NCMEC. Kayla's safe return home after so many years was indeed a miracle. He thanked the South Elgin Police Department, the NCMEC, and all law enforcement agencies involved in the investigation. He also highlighted the importance of the Bring Kayla Home Facebook page in raising awareness and spreading her story. He also requested isolation in light of this transforming moment as they continue on the journey of reacquainting themselves and embracing a new chapter together. On the fateful evening of October 19, 2004, the life of a 28-year-old mother, Keisha Brown, was cut short within the confines of her own apartment near the 700 block of East Flamingo Road in Las Vegas, Nevada. Her lifeless body was found in a bathtub. The heart-wrenching discovery revealed a grim scene. Keisha's life had been horrifically taken. Despite tireless investigative efforts, the identity of her assailant remained an enigma and the case turned cold. However, December 21, 2022 marked a turning point of this case and the killer was finally unmasked owing to the emergence of new evidence and cutting-edge forensic testing. So, who was this ruthless murderer who could have committed such a horrible act? What was his motive? Our case takes us to Las Vegas, a city known for its casinos and amazing shows. The people are adventure-loving and friendly, making the city even more lively. However, there's an alarming concern about crime. The crime rate, especially violent crime, is higher than in any other place in the U.S. The Flamingo Road in Las Vegas is known for its mix of commercial, residential, and entertainment establishments. The eastern part offers diverse attractions. The area is characterized by busy traffic, commercial centers, and various businesses. Unfortunately, the vibrant atmosphere of the neighborhood was tragically shattered on October 19, 2004, when the life of 28-year-old Keisha Brown was taken. Let's dig deep into the story of Keisha Brown. Born in the mid-1970s, Keisha's early life remains enigmatic, with little information available about her parents, upbringing, schooling, or potential siblings. However, what remains undisputed is that she found herself as a young mother residing in a modest apartment along the bustling East Flamingo Road in 2004. Amid the shadows of mystery, her young daughter Kalia, shown as the source of Keisha's unwavering pride and joy, Determined to secure a better life for her beloved child, Keisha took on life's challenges with resolute determination, even though her exact means of livelihood remain unknown. A survivor by nature, 
Keisha exuded a spirit that refused to succumb to life's adversities. At the time, Keisha was also in a relationship with a man who was only identified as her boyfriend and whose connection to Kalia remains unknown. The course of fate took a tragic turn on that fateful Tuesday evening, October 19, 2004. This date etched itself indelibly into the collective memory of those who would come to know Keisha's story. At approximately 7 p.m. on October 19, 2004, Keisha's boyfriend arrived at her apartment, eager to reunite with his beloved. Knocking on the door in anticipation, his hopeful gestures were met with an eerie silence. As his concern grew, he attempted to turn the doorknob, only to find it turning unsettlingly. Pushing the door open, he ventured into the apartment, his voice calling out for Keisha, met with an unsettling emptiness. The apartment itself seemed to hold its breath as the boyfriend's search led him through its rooms. His steps echoed through the space, accompanied by his heart pounding, growing louder with each passing moment. His journey culminated in the bathroom, where a horrifying sight awaited him. There, concealed beneath a heap of clothes, lay Keisha's motionless form in the bathtub. Shock coursed through his veins as he registered the devastating scene before him. Keisha lay lifeless, her body bearing the unmistakable marks of an inhuman attack. Blood stained the bathroom, and the boyfriend's realization sent a jolt of panic through his entire being. She had been strangled, stabbed, and beaten, her life cruelly taken away. As he checked for signs of life, the dreadful truth became undeniable. Keisha was beyond rescue. Desperation gripped him as he comprehended the gravity of the situation. With a heart heavy with grief and anguish, he called 911. At 7.13 p.m., the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department was alerted to the crime scene. Responding swiftly, law enforcement officers descended upon the apartment, accompanied by paramedics. However, Keisha's life had already been stolen, leaving behind a scene of devastation that defied comprehension. Her lifeless body was tenderly removed from the apartment for the autopsy. This first step involved carefully collecting evidence from the scene, recognizing its potential significance and cracking the case wide open. Foreign DNA was collected from the scene and stored in the hope of it being useful later in the investigation. The detectives then embarked on an exhaustive journey, diligently questioning individuals who might possess crucial information. Among those interviewed was Keisha's boyfriend, a significant figure in her life. During those conversations, a pivotal lead emerged. The appearance of an unfamiliar man arriving in a red sedan. A stranger whose actions had raised suspicion. Eyewitness accounts pieced together a sequence of events. The stranger's arrival, his swift entry into Keisha's apartment, and his subsequent departure with a duffel bag in hand. Although the details surrounding Keisha's daughter's presence at the time remain unclear, it was established that she was away from the apartment during the stranger's visit. The man's rapid departure left a trail of uncertainty, prompting witnesses to describe him as a black male with a stocky build. Armed with these fragments of information, the detectives doggedly pursued their leads engaging with the community and checking out any possible clues. Keisha's autopsy results 
also painted a distressing picture, confirming that she had been strangled to death in a horrifying act of violence. The autopsy revealed further evidence of an assault, including stabbing and blunt force injuries. The shocking nature of the findings reverberated throughout the community, leaving residents grappling with the harsh reality of the crime that had taken place. Despite the relentless determination of the detectives, the investigation was plagued by a series of grim revelations that cast a somber shadow over their pursuit of justice. Moreover, the available technology for analyzing DNA evidence was not as sophisticated as it is today. This limitation severely hampered the detective's ability to definitively link evidence to potential suspects, prolonging the process of identifying and apprehending the individual responsible for Keisha's untimely demise. Eventually, with no more leads to follow, the case went cold. After years of gathering dust, Keisha's unresolved case experienced a resurgence when it was handed over to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's Homicide Cold Case Unit on July 8, 2022. Recognizing the urgency of finding closure, the department conducted a comprehensive review of the case, assembling a team of seasoned detectives to breathe new life into the investigation. As this dedicated team delved into the archives and went through all of the intricate details, one of the detectives, Dan Long, stumbled upon a previously overlooked lead that held the promise of unlocking the mystery. Detective Dan Long identified a pattern that bore a striking resemblance to some cases he had worked on back in 2005. These cases involved the tragic murders of three unrelated young women, each occurring on different occasions. What tied these cases together was not only the chillingly similar manner in which the women had been murdered, but also the way their bodies had been left behind. This unsettling pattern prompted Detective Dan to dig deeper, driven by a hunch that there might be a connection that had eluded authorities in the past. As the team pursued this new lead, they discovered a name that would prove to be a pivotal breakthrough. Norman Flowers. Norman Flowers had emerged as a common thread linking the three cases from 2005, having been identified as the perpetrator behind the murders of those young women. Norman Keith Flowers was born on March 15, 1974, and grew up in a dysfunctional family environment in Compton, California, an area known for its poverty and violence. Raised amidst physical abuse and periods of abandonment, his childhood experiences left lasting scars on his psychological and emotional well-being. Flowers' early life was marked by involvement in criminal activities. In 1993, he was convicted of burglary, robbery, and an arson fire that resulted in the death of a dog. He continued down a criminal path, with a 1999 conviction for the unlawful use of a deadly weapon and burglary. After serving time for his offenses, he was released in 2003. In early 2005, over a span of 41 days, Flowers embarked on a horrific crime spree in Las Vegas. His victims were three women, all of whom he had connections to through his relationships with two different girlfriends. His first known victim was 18-year-old Sheila Quarles, his ex-girlfriend's daughter. On March 24, 2005, he assaulted and strangled Sheila in her apartment, leaving her body in a tub filled with water. Flowers' second wave of attacks occurred on May 4, 2005, 
In eight hours, he burglarized two apartments. The first victim, 45-year-old Marilee Coote, fell prey to his violence. He bludgeoned, assaulted, and strangled her. Later that night, he targeted 25-year-old Rena Gonzalez, subjecting her to a similar assault and strangulation using a telephone cord. Despite his heinous crimes, Flowers initially denied any involvement during police interviews. However, his denial was undermined by the power of forensic evidence, as DNA found on Marilee's body linked him definitively to the murders. Flowers was arrested on June 6, 2005, and charged with Marilee's murder. Subsequent investigations further connected him to the deaths of Sheila and Rena. In 2008, Flowers faced trial for the murder of Sheila Quarles. Prosecutors sought the death penalty, but his family members testified about his traumatic childhood, appealing for leniency. The jury ultimately chose a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In June 2011, Flowers entered an Alford plea for the remaining charges related to the murders of Marilee Coote and Rena Gonzalez. This plea allowed him to acknowledge that there was enough evidence to convict him without admitting guilt. Consequently, he received two more life sentences for these crimes in August of 2011. Detective Dan thoroughly reviewed the details of Norman's gruesome crimes. Recognizing DNA testing as a definitive path forward, he swiftly assembled the pertinent evidence from Keisha's case, packaging it with a sense of purpose before sending it to the DNA lab. On December 21, 2022, when the outcomes were revealed, Norman was deemed the culprit. The revelation sent shockwaves through the department. The realization that Keisha had unknowingly became Norman's first victim. The puzzle pieces were finally falling into place, and the focus of the investigation sharpened as the detectives began to map out their strategy to bring Norman to justice. Unlike most cases, the detectives didn't need to launch a manhunt for the suspect. Norman was already held within the confines of the High Desert State Prison in Nevada, serving his three life sentences for the heinous crimes he had committed. Still, the detectives formulated their plan with a mixture of determination and caution. They knew the evidence was on their side but they needed to ensure that every aspect was considered. On February 23, 2023, Detective Dan's unwavering determination yielded significant results. He successfully secured an arrest warrant for Norman Keith Flowers. The charges outlined in the warrant were weighty. They held the potential for severe penalties. Open murder with a deadly weapon physical assault with a deadly weapon, and burglary with a deadly weapon. It was pivotal in pursuing justice for Keisha and her grieving family. The detectives were resolute in their mission, driven by an unshakable commitment to ensure that Norman faced the full brunt of the law for his heinous actions against Keisha. On that same day, a police briefing was convened to address the developments in the case. Amid the assembled officers and officials, the atmosphere was tense, mirroring the gravity of the situation. The briefing held profound significance, not only for the law enforcement personnel involved, but also for a grieving family seeking closure. During a press conference held by the Metropolitan Police Department, Lieutenant Jason Johansson stood before a gathering of media representatives and the public to deliver a significant announcement. The moment's wait was palpable as the gravity of the news was reflected in the tear-streaked faces of Keisha's grieving family members, who stood behind him, their emotions raw and visible. Among those standing in the backdrop was Keisha's daughter, 
Kalia Brown. Overwhelmed by emotions, and with tears streaming down her face, Kalia Brown stepped forward to express her gratitude amidst her grief. Her words, though halting and laden with emotion, conveyed a deep sense of appreciation for the efforts of the police department in shedding light on her mother's tragic fate and providing a semblance of closure. In her own words, she tearfully acknowledged, I just want to say thank you to the police department. Without knowing anything that happened to my mom, no questions could be answered for me through anyone. The fact that I'm getting to know this I'm just thankful for it. Lieutenant Jason Johansson then took the podium to extend his appreciation to those who had contributed to this crucial development. He recognized the Las Vegas DNA Forensic Lab, the Clark County District Attorney's Office, and the victim advocates for their unwavering support. Their collective efforts had made the press conference possible underscoring their shared commitment to achieving justice for the victims of these heinous crimes and offering a sense of closure and resolution to the grieving families. As the briefing concluded, the resounding message was clear. The wheels of justice were in motion, and the arrest of Norman Keith Flowers marked a significant stride towards closure not only for Keisha's family, but also for a community that had held its collective breath for far too long. The path ahead promised a demanding legal process, but the journey towards justice had taken a crucial step forward, bringing hope to those who had long yearned for an answer. Uncertain of what occurred, Marcelina was rushed to a Pensacola, Florida hospital, but it was too late. She passed away the next day on December 31st. An autopsy revealed the toddler had suffered a blow to the head. But what really happened that fateful night? And what led to such a tragedy for little Marcelina? Niceville, Florida is a community known for its small-town charm and friendly atmosphere. Living there is generally peaceful, offering residents a blend of recreational and historic sites to explore. Imagine strolling through parks or visiting preserved landmarks that tell the stories of years gone by. The people here are generally warm and welcoming, often giving the town its reputation as Niceville, not just in name but in spirit. However, this tranquility is somewhat offset by its crime rate, which, while not alarmingly high, is present nonetheless. In this seemingly serene setting, the tragic case of Marcelina Eliza unfolded, adding a chilling chapter to Niceville's story. Marcelina Eliza was born on December 15, 2000 a bright new addition to the world. She entered the life of her mother, Mary Jean Liza, bringing joy that only a child can. In her short time, she grew into a vibrant little girl, her chubby cheeks and dark hair framing wide, curious eyes. By 2002, she was living in Niceville, Florida, in the loving care of her mother, Mary Jean Liza. Information about her father remains unknown. Marcelina, a vibrant toddler, lived with her mom in a close-knit community. Tragically, unbeknownst to anyone, darker days loomed just around the corner for young Marcelina. On the morning of December 30th, 2002, life seemed ordinary for Marcelina Liza and her mother, Mary Jean in their home in Niceville, Florida. For a two-year-old, routines are often about the simple joys of life, breakfast, playtime, a favorite toy. For Marcelina, her day would likely have started like any other, with her mother, Mary, caring for her as she had done every day since she was born. 
But this day was tragically different. Her mother Mary noticed a sudden and frightening change when Marcelina had a seizure and became unresponsive. In a rush of fear, Mary contacted emergency services, and Marcelina was taken to a hospital in Pensacola, Florida. At this point, Marcelina's condition was critical, and despite the medical team's best efforts, hope was slipping away. Sadly, the following day on December 31st, 2002, Marcelina passed away at the tender age of just two years old. The crushing weight of this loss was felt immediately by her mother, her grief profound and raw. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, as Marcelina's death appeared to be a homicide, the authorities were contacted without delay by those close to Mary. After Marcelina's tragic death, investigators quickly arrived on the scene. They began by questioning Mary, Marcelina's mother, and the medical staff who had attended to the little girl at the hospital. It didn't take long for a disturbing picture to emerge. Marcelina had multiple injuries, including 18 bruises scattered across her small body. An autopsy was performed and the medical examiner determined her death was a homicide, caused by blunt force head trauma. At the outset, the police had neither leads nor other suspects. Their questioning focused intensely on Mary, trying to unravel the mystery of what happened to Marcelina. Mary, however, repeatedly told investigators that she couldn't recall anything about the incident and firmly stated she had no knowledge of how her child died. On November 6, 2003, in a subsequent round of questioning, Mary's narrative shifted. She told detectives that she might have blacked out due to anger, and in that state, unintentionally harmed her child. This statement turned Mary into a prime suspect in Marcelina's murder. But proving her guilt was no simple task. The evidence wasn't strong enough to definitively link her to the crime. Investigators conducted a thorough inquiry, speaking with multiple witnesses. They learned that Mary was known for having a significant temper, but there was no previous history of her experiencing blackouts. Despite this new information, it still wasn't enough to definitively pinpoint Mary as the killer. As the leads grew cold and the evidence remained inconclusive, Marcelina's case, heartbreakingly, began to stall, eventually transitioning into a cold case that left a community seeking answers and justice for a life taken far too soon. Nearly two decades had passed since the tragic death of Marcelina Liza, but the case was not forgotten in the minds of the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office. Captain David Allen and his team of dedicated investigators weren't ready to let this cold case stay cold. After almost 19 years, they decided it was time to take a fresh look at all the evidence surrounding Marcelina's death. The team's approach was methodical. They wanted to look at the evidence through new eyes, questioning everything, and challenging their own assumptions. They reached out to the medical examiner's office for a reevaluation of the case. Could there have been a mistake somewhere in the original analysis? Captain Allen and his colleagues were determined to find out. In April of 2021, a significant breakthrough came. The medical examiner conducted a meticulous autopsy on Marcelina's remains and made a heart-wrenching determination. The little girl had died from shaken baby syndrome. This condition typically happens when a parent or caregiver, driven to frustration or anger, 
often by a child's persistent crying, violently shakes the baby or toddler. This brutal shaking causes the child's brain to move back and forth within the skull, leading to bruising, swelling, and often fatal bleeding of the brain. The re-evaluation of this case wasn't solely focused on the medical side of things. Captain Allen and his team knew that they needed more. They conducted new interviews and dove into old records. They found themselves knocking on doors and talking to people who might hold the missing pieces of this devastating puzzle. According to reports from local Florida ABC affiliate WMBB-TV, when Marcelina died, her mother had told investigators that she blacked out and didn't know how her daughter had died. But now, investigators were hearing a different story from multiple witnesses. The evidence was building, and for the first time in almost two decades, the pieces were fitting together in a way that painted a clear and disturbing picture. With the newly acquired evidence and testimonies in hand, Captain Allen stated, Based on the evidence we had and new interviews, we were able to submit an arrest warrant for felony murder on the mother. One can only imagine the surprise Mary Jean must have felt when law enforcement officers arrived to arrest her on September 23, 2022, nearly 20 years after her daughter's tragic death. After the death of her daughter, Mary moved to California. The long arm of the law reached her there, where she was arrested by deputies with the Yuba County Sheriff's Department. Currently, she was held without bail in the Yuba County Jail under the name Mary Jean Liza. The authorities then extradited her back to Okaloosa County, Florida, where she would face at least one charge of murder for the death of her daughter Marcelina. Sheriff Eric Aiden of Okaloosa County expressed how deeply his investigators care about solving these cold cases. It's not just a job for them. They are passionate about their role in delivering justice, and they commit themselves to turning over every stone, examining every crumb of evidence that might breathe new life into a case that has gone cold. In this case, the investigators' tireless efforts have managed to ignite new hope in a nearly 20-year-old tragedy, offering the possibility of closure and justice for little Marcelina Liza. Mary Jean Liza, born in 1985, found herself at the center of a terrible storm. With roots tracing back to her birthplace, she was a 38-year-old Asian or Pacific Islander female. A few years after her daughter's death, Mary called 2324 Pritania Circle, Navarre, Florida home. Despite her seemingly normal life, Mary was known to have a fiery temper. It's a trait that marked her relationships, casting a shadow on many of her interactions. Her temper wasn't just a minor quirk. It was a dominant aspect of her personality that could erupt in violent ways. Unfortunately, no one in her life seemed able to quell this part of her. There was no evidence of previous criminal behavior in Mary's past, but her temper has now intersected tragically with the law. It's a dark crossroads that no one would have expected for her, considering the lack of a prior criminal record. The shocking incident that led to her arrest leaves friends, neighbors, and community members grappling with the stark reality of the situation. This prompted immediate contact with the police to unravel what went so horribly wrong. According to the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office, the details of this tragic story reveal a sequence of events that led to the heartbreaking death of a young child, Marcelina Liza. The information in the arrest report sheds light on a family arrangement fraught with tension and eventual tragedy. At the time, Marcelina had an existing case file 
with the Florida Department of Children and Families Care, and her mother, Mary Jean, did not have primary custody of her. The primary guardians, whose identities have not been disclosed, were slated to go out of town on vacation. Recognizing the importance of family, the Department of Children and Families granted Mary Jean an extended overnight stay with Marcelina. This arrangement began on December 20, 2002. In the initial days of the visit, everything seemed to be going well. A caseworker visited the home three days after the overnight stays began. During the visits, the caseworker observed Marcelina as active and healthy, showing no signs of injury or distress. Just a few days later, on December 29th, Mary Jean's sister paid a visit to the home and also noted that the child appeared to be safe and healthy. Then came December 30th, 2002, a day that would prove to be pivotal and devastating. On this day, Mary Jean was alone at home with her daughter. Later, when they were picked up by an unnamed witness, this person immediately noticed something alarming. Marcelina was lethargic and unresponsive. Concerned, the witness questioned Mary Jean about the child's condition. In response, Mary Jean explained that Marcelina had been sick for a few days. Despite this illness, Mary Jean had not sought any medical treatment for her daughter. As the day progressed, the situation became increasingly dire. After Mary Jean took Marcelina for a diaper change, a terrifying turn of events unfolded. Marcelina began to have a seizure and stopped breathing. In a frantic rush to seek medical assistance, both the witness and Mary Jean hurriedly took the young girl to Twin Cities Hospital in Niceville. It was at this point upon examination they discovered she had multiple contusions, numbering 18. A subsequent CT scan indicated signs of brain shrinkage and persistent blood clots on the surface of the brain. As a result, she was moved to Sacred Heart Hospital in Pensacola, but sadly she did not make it. While awaiting her day in court, Mary was held without bail finding herself in the stark environment of the Yuba County Jail. There, she was not listed under her commonly used name, but under the formal designation Mary Jean Liza. As the gravity of her situation became more and more real, she was given a date to mark on her calendar, February 13, 2023. This was not set to be her trial, but rather a pre-trial conference a critical step in the legal process. This pretrial conference is a crucial event where the prosecution and defense would come together before a judge. Typically, they discuss the evidence, consider potential plea bargains, and set the stage for how the trial might unfold. For Mary, this conference would be a pivotal moment, possibly shaping the trajectory of her future. At this point, the specifics about what transpired during Mary's pretrial conference remain tightly under wraps, as it is yet to be released to the public. Sheriff Eric Aiden didn't hesitate in taking a moment to address the community regarding the Marcelina Liza cold case. He highlighted the relentless dedication displayed by the investigators at OCSO. Specifically, he expressed his gratitude towards the CID, or Criminal Investigation Division, for their unwavering commitment to the case. Sheriff Aiden emphasized that he, along with his colleagues, hold a deep passion for revisiting cold cases. Their approach is steadfast. Even if they don't have an immediate solution, they're committed to searching, investigating, and probing. Their aim? To find any piece of information any small clue that might inch them closer to progress in the case. The Marcelina Liza case exemplifies this spirit of perseverance. 
It was a testament to the lengths the team would go to ensure justice. As the details unfolded, and the community sought closure, families, neighbors, and friends felt compelled to reach out, reinforcing their trust in the police and their pursuit of truth. On August 7th of 1975, Laurel Jean Mitchell was found drowned in a river near her home, with her pants unzipped, being worn inside out. On a quiet Wednesday evening of August 6th, 1975, the life of 17-year-old Laura Jean Mitchell was tragically cut short after she completed her shift at the Epworth Forest Church Camp near North Webster Lake in Cassiasco County. Initially ruled as a tragic drowning, the autopsy told a different story. The young woman had in fact fiercely fought for her life. However, the case went cold for almost five decades with no significant leads. Until February of 2023, when advancements in scientific techniques brought new hope to the once cold case. Who might have caused harm to the teenager? And what could have been their motive? What breakthrough DNA evidence finally unraveled the web of secrets surrounding Laurel's untimely demise? Our case moves us to the peaceful town of North Webster, located in Cassiasco County, Indiana. Though it might seem small, this lake-centered community has much to offer visitors and residents including festivals, restaurants, shopping, and water recreation. Notably, the town stands as a beacon of safety, with crime rates below the national average, a testament to its peacefulness. However, on August 6, 1975, the tranquil town of North Webster, Indiana, was forever changed by a baffling incident that would haunt this small community for decades. Laurel was born on May 24, 1958, to Richard Mitchell and Wilma Mitchell in the town of North Webster. Her siblings included an older brother, Bruce, and a younger sister named Sarah. They had a close-knit bond that stood the test of occasional rivalry, and only grew stronger over time. Laurel's sunny disposition and warm smile quickly endeared her to the community particularly adored by the neighborhood children, Laurel was often surrounded by a joyful crowd of young ones, seeking her attention and affection. Music held a special place in Laurel's heart, among her many talents. From an early age, her natural gift for singing shone brightly, earning her a prominent spot in the local church choir. But her musical pursuits didn't stop there. Laurel was also a skilled dancer, diligently honing her craft through lessons at a nearby studio. As she approached her senior year at Wallace High School at the age of 17, Laurel chose to take on a job at the Cokesbury Inn, a small restaurant in Epworth Forest. Her boundless energy and enthusiasm made her a fast favorite among colleagues and patrons solidifying her reputation as a cherished community member. By 1975, Laurel's life seemed to radiate with promise. Her job brought her joy. Her friendships enriched her days. And a bright future lay ahead. Yet unbeknownst to Laurel, destiny had a different path in store. A path that would lead her story to intersect with an enigmatic, and tragic event. On the sunny day of August 6, 1975, the Mitchell family woke up to what seemed like an ordinary day, blissfully unaware that their lives were on the brink of a profound and tragic shift. Laurel, her younger sister Sarah, and a friend staying over began their morning tasks with youthful enthusiasm. Their elder brother Bruce, being in the army, was stationed in California at the time. 
Amid the daily routines, Richard and Wilma bid their daughters farewell and headed to their workplaces. By afternoon, Laurel left for her job at the Cokesbury Inn. She embraced the tasks ahead with a characteristic smile, and time raced by. By 10 p.m., her shift concluded, and thoughts of a thrilling evening with friends at Adventureland, a nearby amusement park, filled her mind. Declining a co-worker's offer for a ride home, Laurel set off towards Adventureland at around 10.15 p.m. Anticipating a fun night, she ventured into the darkness, unknowingly taking her last steps alive. Meanwhile, Laurel's parents remained unaware of the impending tragedy, believing their daughter was simply out and enjoying time with her friends. Thinking she had gone home after work, her friends decided to change their plans and attend a county fair in Warsaw instead. Around midnight, one of Laurel's friends, part of the group Laurel was meant to meet, returned to Laurel's home. Concern turned to alarm when she and Laurel's family realized Laurel hadn't arrived. Details of the night unfolded, revealing her absence from the planned gathering. Richard and Wilma exchanged uneasy glances with growing worry, sensing something was amiss. Aware of Laurel's responsible nature, her failure to return home weighed heavily. Anxiety mounted as the minutes dragged into hours, prompting the realization that they couldn't merely wait. Action was imperative. The clock struck 4 a.m. Desperation led them to contact the police, reporting Laurel as missing. A cloud of uncertainty started to loom over the Mitchell family. Come the following day, the news of Laurel's disappearance rippled through the neighborhood, sparking swift concern. Neighbors and friends joined forces, launching a determined search effort that spanned the woods and nearby roadsides, desperate to locate any sign of her. Back at home, Laurel's younger sister, Sarah, awoke to the unsettling realization that her sister was absent. Overwhelmed by distress, Sarah discovered she was in no mood to attend her scheduled softball practice. Despite her heavy heart, her parents encouraged her to go as they grappled with their own worry and uncertainty. Around 10.30 a.m. on that same morning, a fisherman named Glenn Dixon and his son Hagar set off for the Elkhart River situated roughly 15 miles from where Laurel had worked. Their intention was to enjoy a day of fishing. A chilling sight caught their attention as they prepared for their activity. A fully clothed body floating in the water. Drawing closer, the grim truth became apparent. They had stumbled upon a lifeless body that had likely been adrift for some time. The discovery cast a dark shadow over their day, prompting them to swiftly notify the authorities. Within moments, the serene riverbank transformed into a scene of activity as law enforcement personnel converged to unravel the mystery. The atmosphere crackled with urgency and determination as everyone sought to identify the victim and unearth the circumstances surrounding her demise. Tension hung in the air as time seemed to stretch on. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, the officers pieced together a grim revelation. The victim was none other than Laurel, the very teenager whose parents had reported her missing just hours earlier. With this heartbreaking confirmation, Laurel's fate was sealed, and her body was soon taken for an autopsy. As soon as the police discovered the body, it was sent for an autopsy. The results of her autopsy were later unveiled. The official report indicated that her cause of death was accidental drowning, 
although there were some signs of bruises on her hands and shoulder. Shockingly, the report also divulged that she had been assaulted. The revelation sent shockwaves rippling through the town, leaving residents stunned and grappling with the unthinkable question, who could commit such a horrific act? In the wake of this devastating news, authorities swiftly initiated an intensive investigation to untangle the mystery surrounding Laurel's tragic demise. With many unanswered questions, detectives embarked on a mission to gather insights from potential witnesses and unravel the truth. Among these witnesses was Frank Overmeyer, who came forward with a crucial detail. He recounted hearing what sounded like the closing of a car trunk on the night of Laurel's disappearance. At the time of Laurel's death, detectives collected and cataloged her clothing and belongings, which included a silver necklace, a single earring, shoes, undergarments, an unzipped and unbuttoned sweatshirt, and blue jeans. However, due to the limitations of forensic technology at the time, little progress could be made with these items. Laurel's funeral, held at a prominent town church, drew an immense crowd of well-wishers, friends, and family members who gathered to pay their respects to the young woman taken from them too soon. Amid the somber atmosphere, Sarah, Laurel's sister, vividly recalled the gathering, remembering the tight grip of her father and brother's hands, offering comfort during those trying moments. The investigation into Laurel's death gained momentum after her funeral, with multiple state and local agencies joining forces to crack the case. Exhaustive efforts were dedicated to analyzing evidence, conducting interviews, and pursuing every lead. However, despite their unwavering commitment, the answers they sought remained not so conclusive. The circumstances of Laurel's tragic end remained shrouded in mystery, leaving her grieving family in despair, yearning for closure and justice. As the weeks gave way to months, and the months stretched into years, the initial urgency surrounding Laurel's case slowly faded from public view, allowing it to slip into the realm of cold cases. The headlines that once carried her story receded, but the ache of her absence persisted relentlessly within the hearts of her family and friends. In 2007, a pivotal moment arrived as Indiana State Police Captain Kevin Smith took up the mantle of lead investigator for Laurel's unsolved case. Driven by a deep determination, Captain Smith committed himself to achieving the elusive closure that had long eluded Laurel's grieving family. Despite the mounting pressure, he was resolute in his resolve, willing to exhaust every avenue to provide answers. However, the path forward proved to be more challenging than anticipated. Despite Captain Smith's best efforts, years passed without yielding new leads or evidence. Meanwhile, Laurel's parents, Richard and Wilma, never wavered in their dedication to keeping their daughter's memory alive and her case in the public eye. They clung to the hope that someone would eventually step forward with vital information that could finally lead to an arrest and justice. The passage of time, however, took its toll on their health and spirits. In 2012, tragedy struck again, as Richard and Wilma both passed away, mere months apart, their relentless pursuit of justice ending without resolution. Their heartbreaking demise painted a poignant picture of a couple who had invested their lives in seeking answers and closure for their beloved daughter. Despite this heartbreaking turn of events, the memory of Laurel continued to persist, 
undeterred by the passage of time. Law enforcement agencies remained committed to the investigation, driven by a collective determination to end this long-standing mystery. The case, once gone cold, still flickered with a glimmer of hope for resolution and justice, a testament to those enduring love and determination of those who refused to forget. During the reinvestigation phase, the emergence of local witnesses added intriguing pieces to the puzzle. One such witness, Catherine Flynn, became a significant figure. She recalled an incident around 10 p.m. on the night of Laurel's disappearance. Catherine heard the distinct sound of a car reversing near her residence. Amid the sounds, she caught voices uttering the words, Let's get, or let's get her. Another local resident, Frank Overmeyer, also shared his account with investigators. He recounted hearing a loud vehicle in the neighborhood, which he suspected to be an Oldsmobile Cutlass. However, in 2013, a pivotal turn in the case breathed new life into the investigation. A woman named Renee Sexton emerged as a surprising informant, offering a crucial piece of information that had the potential to unravel the mystery. Renee disclosed that back in 1975, when she was just 16 years old, she attended a party with a man named John Lehman. During a car ride after the party, Lehman made a stunning confession to her that he and his friend, Fred Bandy, were responsible for a murder. However, Lehman didn't divulge any specifics about the crime. The following year, in 2014, another tip emerged from a man named Bill McDonald. Bill, a high school sophomore in 1975, claimed to have encountered Fred Bandy at a party shortly after Laurel's tragic death. During their conversation, Fred allegedly bragged about being involved in a crime in the same area where Laurel's body had been discovered. These newfound leads injected a renewed sense of hope into the investigation. Detectives began to re-examine both Fred Bandy and John Lehman as potential suspects. Delving into their past, they sought to uncover any evidence that could tie them to the crime. Their efforts yielded limited results in the case of John Lehman. The situation, however, took a different turn when investigators delved into Fred Bandy's background. Little information is available about the early lives of Fred Bandy and John Wayne Lehman. However, public records reveal that Lehman graduated from West Noble High School and went through two divorces in 1994 and 2001. Conversely, Fred Bandy also had a dark history. In 2001, he faced legal consequences pleading guilty to contributing to the delinquency of a minor. This followed an initial charge of abuse, which was dropped through a plea agreement. According to records from Noble Circuit Court and the Indiana Department of Corrections, Bandy received a two-year prison sentence as part of the plea agreement. The year 2016 brought new charges against Bandy this time for abuse, involving two cases with victims under 14 years old. Ultimately, he pleaded guilty to the two counts, leading to a prison sentence of five years and 11 months. Records from his time behind bars indicate that Bandy was released in the spring of 2020. Furthermore, in 2019, the clothing and belongings collected from Laurel's body which had been stored away, were retrieved for re-examination under the guidance of Captain Smith. Select items of Laurel's clothing were sent to the state laboratory for DNA testing. Forensic scientists worked tirelessly for weeks meticulously analyzing the evidence. The results showed that Bandy was 13 billion times more likely to be the contributor of the found DNA on Mitchell's clothing than anyone else. 
armed with compelling DNA evidence that linked Fred Bandy to the crime scene, law enforcement swiftly obtained a warrant for his arrest. However, their efforts didn't conclude there. Recognizing the need to construct an airtight case against Bandy, as well as potentially John Wayne Lehman, investigators pressed forward. Understanding the significance of gathering additional evidence, they secured warrants to search both men's residences and collect DNA samples from Lehman. A critical detail emerged during this process. Fred Bandy had owned and driven a 1971 Oldsmobile, aligning with the vehicle witnesses had reported hearing on the night of Laurel's disappearance. Detectives meticulously pieced together a chilling sequence of events based on this information. Their theory suggested that Bandy and Lehman had coerced Laurel into their car, driven her to the river, and then intentionally drowned her. This distressing revelation sent shockwaves through everyone involved in the case, unveiling a horrifying narrative that raised questions about the depths of human cruelty. On February 6, 2023, a dedicated team of detectives executed their operation, apprehending Fred Bandy and John Wayne Lehman at their respective residences. The charges laid against them were nothing short of first-degree murder. At the time of their arrest, both men were 67 years old, decades removed from the alleged crime, but now facing the reckoning that justice demanded. When Captain Smith reached out to Laurel's sister Sarah and her brother Bruce to share the news of the arrests, it was met with mixed emotions. Surprise was undoubtedly among them. The sudden progress in the case was unexpected. Amid the gratitude for this significant breakthrough, both Sarah and Bruce couldn't help but feel a pang of sorrow, wishing their parents were still alive to witness this momentous development. The closure that had once eluded their family for so long was finally within reach. Yet the absence of their parents casts a shadow over the long-awaited progress. As we conclude this gripping account of the North Webster tragedy, On March 27, 1998, a local from Laletta took his son out on his boat on the Eel River in search of driftwood. But what they stumbled upon was unexpected human remains, close to Cock Robin Island. The body was partly clothed and had been in the water for a long time. No ID was found. Without further delay, they quickly alerted the police about the discovery. Who was this individual? And how did this person end up in the river? Laletta in California has its own vibe. It's a place where the whispers of the ocean mix with the hum of daily life. This town offers a mix of both recreational and historic spots, making it a unique blend for both locals and visitors. If you're living here, you'll notice a community bond. People know each other and share stories. They cherish the landmarks and often spend weekends exploring them. But like many places, Loletta has its challenges. The crime rate? A bit of a concern for some. And amidst these crime statistics, one particular case stands out. The mystery of the remains found by the Eel River. On a regular day in March 1998, a local of Loletta and his son decided to head out to the Eel River. The river was a favorite spot for residents looking for driftwood to sell and had seen countless boating trips, but none quite like this. As the boat gently skimmed the river's surface, the day's tranquility was punctured by a harrowing sight near Cock Robin Island. The silhouette of a human body, 
partially clothed. Bobbing in the gentle sway of the river's current drew their immediate attention. The eerie sight prompted an immediate call to the local sheriff's department. Without wasting time, the sheriff's deputies equipped with a jet boat made their way swiftly to the reported location. The recovery was sobering. The body was not just lifeless. It showed signs of prolonged immersion. Advanced decomposition made it hard to recognize any distinguishing features immediately. However, the person, a white male adult, had distinct measurements. About 5 foot 10 inches in height, weighing roughly 170 pounds, and appearing to be between 35 and 45 years old. His identity was unknown, so they named him Loletta John Doe. After a comprehensive autopsy, the experts concluded that the remains had been submerged for approximately a month. The cause of death? A possible drowning. It's chilling to think about that month. What events led up to that fateful moment? Were there signs or a routine break that something was amiss? The sudden emergence of the John Doe from Loletta shook the community, prompting investigators to embark on a comprehensive probe into his identity. Early on, the California Department of Justice, or CADOJ, became instrumental in these efforts. In their diligent sweep for clues, they recovered a latent fingerprint. Surprisingly, it was his fingerprint. Usually, decomposition leads to fingerprints that aren't useful, so this was a big discovery. Hope surged. This could be the lead that solves the puzzle. But the high-tech search through the automated latent print system dashed these hopes. The fingerprint yielded no matches, and the man's identity remained obscured. Not to be deterred, the investigative team sought the help of a local dentist. A forensic dental examination was performed, laying bare another layer of the mystery. Yet just as with the fingerprints, no answers emerged. The process of elimination continued and DNA became the next frontier. The hope was that the man's genetic code might finally give him a name. A DNA sample from the remains was meticulously collected and archived in two significant databases. The California Missing Persons DNA Database and the National Unidentified Persons DNA Index. Additionally, the case's details were meticulously logged into the NamUs under designation UP54357 to widen the net. Every now and then, this DNA profile was compared with profiles from missing persons and other human remains in the combined index system, commonly known as CODIS. Still, the search came up empty. No profile matches. Nothing. A veil of mystery continued to shroud the identity of Loletta John Doe. As months turned into years, the energy of the initial investigation began to fade. By their very nature, missing person cases never close. Reminders of unsolved tragedies. Yet the reality is that some trails grow cold. Despite the relentless pursuit, and the efforts of seasoned investigators, this case seemed to be settling into that icy realm of the unsolved. But then, 24 years later, which was 2022, it brought a glimmer of hope. In December, the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office, HCSO, and the CADOJ saw potential in an emerging field, forensic genealogy. They partnered with Othrom Inc., a state-of-the-art forensic genealogy lab. The objective was simple, yet ambitious. Use advanced DNA techniques to pierce through the shadows and identify the unknown man, 
or at least find a close relative. Thanks to Roads to Justice funding, the investigators shipped a DNA extract from the remains they had stored to Othram. Using cutting-edge forensic-grade genome sequencing, the scientists painstakingly built a comprehensive DNA profile. Once assembled, this DNA mosaic went to Othram's expert genealogy team. Through forensic genetic genealogy, they began weaving together the threads of the man's past, seeking investigative leads that might bring resolution. The tide of uncertainty that loomed over the John Doe case from Loletta began to recede in 2023. Mid-February brought a revelation that, in many ways, was the glimmer of closure many had been desperately hoping for. The Humboldt County Sheriff's Office received a report from Othram with all the makings of a potential breakthrough. The DNA profile, constructed with meticulous precision, pointed towards one individual, Jeffrey Todd Seidau. It was as if, after a prolonged silence, John Doe was beginning to speak. Yet the report held more than just a name. It brought forth links to a network of genetic relatives. Prominently mentioned was a potential sister named Cheryl residing in Missouri. Eager to find the missing pieces of this complex puzzle, HCSO investigators reached out to Cheryl. Upon contact, the mystery began to untangle further. Cheryl, surprised with what she got to know and in sorrow, confirmed the ties. She revealed that Jeffrey Todd Seidau was indeed her brother. But the narrative she wove was tinged with sadness. Jeffrey, for reasons that remained obscure to the family, had ceased all communications sometime in the mid-1990s. The threads of a familial bond, strong as they were, had somehow been severed. Despite Cheryl's best efforts to bridge this chasm, her attempts to find and reconnect with Jeffrey were unsuccessful. Herein lay another layer of complexity. Given the uncertainty surrounding Jeffrey's intentions, whether he had chosen to distance himself, or if other forces were at play, his disappearance was never formally reported. In many ways, the absence of such a report had contributed to the shadows that obscured his fate for so long. But with Othram's report in hand, the HCSO was presented with an opportunity. They could now directly compare the previously obtained latent fingerprint with the unknown fingerprints of Jeffrey. Anticipation hung in the air as the comparison was made but it wasn't long before clarity emerged. The prints matched. John Doe from Laletta had a name, Jeffrey Todd Seidau. The revelation brought mixed emotions. Relief intermingled with sorrow. Clarity tinged with lingering questions. The fabric of Jeffrey's story, once frayed and fragmented, was beginning to mend. But it was a bittersweet moment for his family, especially for Cheryl. The answers they had longed for were finally before them, but they came with the weight of loss and the ache of what could have been. Jeffrey Todd Seidau was not just a name in a cold case file. He was a living, breathing individual with dreams, hopes, and experiences that defined him. Born in 1963, Jeffrey's early years are shrouded in a bit of mystery. The specifics of his parents' names and the exact location of his birth remain unknown, adding a layer of intrigue to his life story. But what we can piece together paints the portrait of a person who, like many, traversed the pathways of life, experiencing its highs and lows. 
Maybe he had passions that he chased relentlessly. Or perhaps there were moments of quiet reflection where he pondered life's bigger questions. The absence of certain details allows our imagination to drift, envisioning Jeffrey immersed in everyday experiences, laughing at a shared joke, or simply enjoying a tranquil sunset. Upon confirmation of Jeffrey's identity, the family, understandably shaken, channeled their grief into honoring him in the most fitting manner they could. Jeffrey had been away from them for so long, and now they were given the heart-wrenching yet essential task of bringing him home. They began coordinating with the Humboldt County Coroner's Office, working out the specifics to have Jeffrey's remains released. It was a collective decision by the Sidow family to lay Jeffrey to rest alongside his departed kin. A sense of unity was palpable as they came together, holding on to one another for support and strength. They aimed to provide Jeffrey with a dignified farewell, a gesture filled with love, respect, and a profound sense of closure. The tireless efforts of the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office, combined with the California Department of Justice DNA Lab and OTHREM, finally brought some much-needed closure to the Seidel family. Their exemplary teamwork played an instrumental role in solving this puzzling case, revealing the fate of Jeffrey Todd Seidel. Acknowledging the value of cutting-edge DNA technology, the HCSO continues to work hand-in-hand hand with the California DOJ and OTHREM. Together, they're revisiting several cold cases, hoping to shed light on those still in the shadows. The puzzle of Jeffrey's life and unfortunate demise might be coming together, but some pieces are still missing. If anyone has details about Jeffrey's activities or whereabouts, leading up to his untimely end, they're encouraged to reach out. The HCSO cold case investigator, Mike Fridley, remains at the helm of these investigations. He can be reached directly at 707-441-3024. Your piece of information, no matter how small, might be the missing link to provide closure to another family waiting for answers. Remember, it's our collective duty to stand by each other and ensure justice is served. Do you think there's more to uncover about Jeffrey's case? What do you think led to such a tragic outcome for him? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Your perspective matters to us and we'd love to hear from you. If you have a particular case in mind that has intrigued you or left you with questions, please drop your recommendations in the comment section below. We're here to delve deep and bring you more compelling true crime stories. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more regular updates. In the early morning hours of Friday, March 19, 1993, 42-year-old Barbara Broadkin was found lifeless in her midtown Toronto apartment on Vallejo Street. In a terrible turn of events, she was discovered by her six-year-old son, Zachary, near her bedroom closet. She had suffered a fatal stab to the chest and showed signs of strangulation. Little did the investigators know that it would take them over 30 years to reach a conclusion for this case. What led to this tragic event? And who could have committed such a crime? Toronto, located in Canada, is a bustling metropolis known for its impressive skyline, including the iconic CN Tower. With a population of nearly 2.8 million, the city's diverse inhabitants contribute to its vibrant lifestyle. Living in Toronto offers a blend of recreational and historic sites, 
catering to various interests. The people here are a mix of cultures, making it one of the most multicultural cities globally. This diversity is one of Toronto's defining characteristics. However, like any major city, Toronto faces challenges. Its crime rate, while relatively low compared to other large metropolises, still exists. And this is where our story takes place. Barbara Broadkin, born on April 24, 1950, hailed from the vibrant city of Toronto. Her early years remained somewhat of a mystery, but Toronto was her home during those formative times. In the 1980s, Barbara met Christopher Barry. Their connection was undeniable, leading them down the aisle in no time. Their joy multiplied in 1987 with the birth of their son, Zachary. However, after this, all was not rosy. Christopher's behavior shifted, becoming distant and, at times, aggressive. For the sake of her son, Barbara mustered the courage to leave, starting afresh in a new apartment at 155 Balliol Street, halfway between Mount Pleasant Road and Young Street. Juggling multiple roles, she worked tirelessly as a secretary and typist. To ensure Zachary's well-being, she even ventured into selling marijuana discreetly. Her primary goal? Giving Zachary the best life she could. By 1993, Barbara was 42, and young Zachary was 6, and they were making the most of their life together, hopeful for brighter days ahead. But unbeknownst to them, a shadow loomed close, threatening to change everything. March 19, 1993 began like any other day in Toronto. The city buzzed with activity as people set out for their daily tasks. But in the Broadkin residence on Balliol Street, an unusual silence prevailed. Young Zachary, just six years old and in the first grade, noticed he had overslept. His mother, Barbara, hadn't woken him for school, which was out of the ordinary. Confused, Zachary began searching the apartment for his mother. Why hadn't she roused him? He approached her bedroom, pushing the door open, expecting to find her, perhaps still asleep. But the scene that met his eyes was one no child should ever witness. Barbara's body lay motionless near her bedroom closet, a pool of blood surrounding her. The closet door stood ajar, hinting at a struggle. Panicking, Zachary remembered the emergency instructions his mother had given him. He rushed to the phone and dialed 911. The operator, initially skeptical hearing a child's voice, quickly grasped the gravity of the situation when Zachary described the horrifying scene. Within minutes, the piercing sound of sirens echoed through Balliol Street as police cars converged on the Broadkin residence marking the beginning of a case that would haunt Toronto for years to come. The investigation into Barbara Brodkin's tragic death was swift and meticulous. Constable Rob Thomas was the first to arrive at the scene. The sight of young Zachary, alone and traumatized, was heart-wrenching. Prioritizing the child's well-being, Thomas quickly escorted him outside shielding him from the grim scene inside the apartment. The area was promptly cordoned off, marking the beginning of an intensive investigation. As more officers and forensic experts descended upon the Balliol Street apartment, they began piecing together the events leading up to Barbara's death. The initial examination of her body revealed a single, fatal stab wound to her chest. Disturbingly, there were also marks around her neck, suggesting strangulation. The scratches and defensive wounds on her arms and hands 
painted a picture of a fierce struggle, indicating that Barbara had bravely fought her attacker. The state of the apartment provided further insights. While the rest of the home was orderly, Barbara's bedroom told a different story. Items were scattered haphazardly, and the room bore the unmistakable signs of a violent confrontation. The open closet door caught the investigator's attention, leading them to theorize that robbery might have been a motive. However, pinpointing what might have been stolen was initially elusive. A few days later, the autopsy results confirmed the initial findings. The stab wound to Barbara's heart was the cause of death, but the strangulation marks on her neck were undeniable. A significant discovery was foreign DNA found under her fingernails, suggesting that Barbara had managed to scratch her assailant in her final moments. These nail clippings were carefully preserved, holding the potential key to identifying her killer. The investigation then shifted to gathering testimonies. Friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, everyone connected to Barbara was interviewed. With over 295 witnesses sharing their accounts, the detectives had many leads to explore. One revelation that stood out was Barbara's side business of selling marijuana. This detail was crucial as it opened up the possibility that her interactions in this trade might have brought her into contact with some unsavory characters. Further inquiries revealed that Barbara stored her marijuana in a cosmetics case in her closet. This case was conspicuously missing from the crime scene. With only $12 found in her wallet and no other cash in the apartment, the detectives felt confident that robbery was a significant motive behind the murder. The missing cosmetics case and the absence of additional cash corroborated this theory. However, as the police delved deeper into the leads trying to match any of Barbara's customers to the foreign DNA or any suspicious activities, they hit a wall. No concrete evidence linked any of her clients to the crime. But the investigation took a twist when interviews with Barbara's close circle hinted at another potential suspect. This individual had a different motive altogether, steering the investigation in a new direction. The detectives were now faced with the challenge of exploring this new lead while ensuring they didn't overlook any other potential clues. As the investigation into Barbara Brodkin's death continued, a name repeatedly surfaced in the interviews with those close to her. Christopher Barry, Barbara's ex-husband and the father of young Zachary. The couple's tumultuous past, marked by a bitter custody battle over their son, made Christopher a person of interest in the eyes of the police. Delving deeper into Christopher's background, the police uncovered a troubling history. During their marriage, Christopher had displayed violent tendencies, often subjecting Barbara to physical and emotional abuse. This violent streak was not limited to his relationship with Barbara. He had been charged with assault in an unrelated incident, and had even made several death threats towards Barbara especially during their heated custody disputes. Given his proximity to Barbara, his knowledge of her daily routines, and his clear motive, Christopher quickly became the prime suspect in the case. Determined to get to the bottom of things, the Toronto police questioned Christopher. Over multiple sessions, they grilled him, employing various interrogation techniques to extract a confession. But Christopher remained steadfast in his denial. He claimed to have been with his girlfriend at the time of the murder. When the police contacted her, she confirmed his alibi, further complicating the investigation. In a bid to ascertain the truth, the police proposed a polygraph test. 
Christopher, showing no hesitation, agreed and subsequently passed the test. The investigators, though frustrated, had one more card to play. They asked Christopher for hair and saliva samples to compare his DNA with the foreign DNA found under Barbara's fingernails. To their surprise, he consented without any hesitation. The samples were promptly sent for testing, and the police waited with bated breath. They believed that this would be the breakthrough they desperately needed. However, the results were not what they had hoped for. The DNA from the samples did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. This revelation was a significant setback for the investigation. With no concrete evidence linking Christopher to the crime and his alibi holding up, the police had no choice but to release him. However, in the minds of many investigators, he remained a prime suspect, even if they couldn't prove it. Eventually, as time passed, the leads began to dry up. The once promising investigation started to lose momentum. Once hopeful of solving the case, the detectives found themselves at a dead end, and the case eventually turned cold. For nearly a quarter of a century, the Barbara Brodkin case remained a haunting mystery. But for young Zachary, the pain and memories were as fresh as ever. The trauma of discovering his mother's lifeless body at the tender age of six was a scar that never truly healed. As the years went by, Zachary grew up, started a family, and tried to move forward, but the shadow of that fateful day lingered. In 2017, a glimmer of hope emerged. The Toronto Police Department decided to reopen the Barbara Brodkin case. And, in a twist that seemed almost scripted by fate, the lead detective assigned was Rob Thomas. The same Rob Thomas who, as a young constable, had been the first to arrive at the Brodkin residence all those years ago. Now seasoned with experience and recognized as the top polygraph officer in the department, Rob felt a deep personal connection to the case. The memory of a distraught young Zachary, alone and scared, was something he could never shake off. He was determined to bring closure to this long-standing mystery. Rob and his team dove into the archives, sifting through old case files and looking for any overlooked details or missed connections. Their initial thought was to re-interview Christopher Barry, Barbara's ex-husband. However, they soon discovered that Christopher had passed away in 2009, closing that avenue of inquiry. But the investigators had another lead. They revisited the physical evidence from the crime scene, particularly the DNA found under Barbara's fingernails. With advancements in forensic science, they hoped to extract a clearer DNA profile. The samples had been preserved for over two decades and were now sent to the Center of Forensic Science. The results were promising. A distinct DNA profile was established. With this new piece of evidence in hand, the team approached the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's National DNA Data Bank. This database held DNA samples from convicted offenders across the country. The chances were slim, but the team was hopeful. And then, against all odds, a match was found. The DNA belonged to a man named Charles Mustard, someone who had never been on the radar during the initial investigation. This revelation was groundbreaking. The case had a new prime suspect for the first time in 24 years. The detectives wasted no time delving into Charles Mustard's background. They uncovered a series of disturbing facts and patterns that painted a chilling picture. The journey to uncover the truth about Barbara Brodkin's tragic end had taken many turns, but with this new lead, 
the hope for justice was rekindled. Charles William Mustard, born in 1954, had a life that blended privilege and pressure. He was the youngest of seven children, born to the renowned Toronto surgeon Dr. William Mustard and his wife, Ellis. Dr. William, a pioneer in heart surgery, was celebrated with the Order of Canada Award and had a place in the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. But behind the accolades and achievements, he was a stern and demanding father. The Mustard household was run with military precision. Dr. William's expectations were high, and he wasn't above using unconventional methods, like throwing a tardy child into a freezing lake to instill discipline. Despite his strict upbringing, Charles had access to the best education money could buy. He attended elite private and boarding schools throughout his youth. Later, he pursued a career in teaching, earning degrees in physical health and education from Lakeheed University in Thunder Bay. It was during his time at university that he met his future wife, whose name was not revealed to the public, a fellow aspiring teacher. By the early 90s, Charles, now a father of two, taught at an elementary school in Thornhill, a town in southern Ontario. However, his life turned dark when he was arrested for multiple counts of inhumane assault at a local shopping mall. This incident cost him his job. Around this period, he crossed paths with Barbara, purchasing marijuana from her. Detectives later theorized that financial strain following the loss of his job, might have driven Charles to rob and subsequently murder Barbara. The 90s were tumultuous for Charles. In 1993, he faced legal consequences for his mall assault. Two years later, disillusioned and concerned for their children, his wife left him. Over the next decade and a half, Charles' criminal record grew. He accumulated 12 convictions for his offenses against women between 1993 and 2007. His last recorded crime was a theft in 2011. Due to his repeated offenses, Charles's DNA was added to Canada's national database in 2002. This inclusion would prove pivotal. By 2017, when the Toronto Police Department reopened Barbara's case, they tested the DNA found under her fingernails against the national database. The match led them straight to Charles Mustard. By 2018, Charles's life had spiraled further. He was found residing in subsidized housing in downtown Toronto, relying on Ontario disability support payments. The discovery of the DNA match was a turning point in the Barbara Brodkin cold case. With this newfound evidence and Charles Mustard's troubling history, the Toronto police felt confident enough to make an arrest. On October 18, 2018, they summoned Mustard to the police headquarters in Toronto under the pretense of signing some paperwork. As a strategic move, they displayed large posters of Barbara in the lobby, keenly observing Mustard's reaction. He seemed to be deeply engrossed in examining the photos. The very next day on Friday, October 19, 2018, Charles Mustard was officially arrested and charged with the murder of Barbara Brodkin. The case swiftly moved to trial a few months later, presided over by Ontario Superior Court Justice Brian O'Mara. The trial, however, was anything but swift spanning over five years. Throughout the trial, Mustard maintained his innocence. He painted a picture of a friendly relationship with Barbara, bonded by their mutual interest in marijuana. He claimed the last time he saw her was during a casual marijuana purchase. When questioned about his intense scrutiny of Barbara's posters at the police station, he feigned ignorance claiming he didn't recognize her. Justice O'Mara quickly labeled this a blatant lie, 
especially since Mustard had previously described Barbara as a friend. The crux of the prosecution's case was the DNA evidence. Mustard tried to explain it away, suggesting that their shared marijuana joint could have been the source of the DNA transfer. However, forensic experts refuted this, stating that such a casual interaction wouldn't leave significant DNA traces under someone's fingernails. In a desperate move, Mustard's defense tried to shift the blame to Christopher Barry, Barbara's ex-husband, highlighting his abusive past. But the prosecution was prepared. They presented Barry's alibi and the fact that his DNA did not match the samples from the crime scene. After a lengthy trial, on February 23, 2023, Justice Brian O'Mara delivered the verdict. Charles Mustard, now 69, was found guilty of second-degree murder in the death of Barbara Brodkin. His bail was immediately revoked, and he was taken into custody. The final chapter of this long, drawn-out case would conclude with Mustard's sentencing hearing in April. On Wednesday, April 5, 2023, Mustard was sentenced to life, without a chance of parole for 15 years. Justice Brian O'Mara delivered the sentence in the Ontario Superior Court. Before handing down his sentence, O'Mara asked Mustard if he had anything to say. Rising from his seat, Mustard refuted the claim that he had taken Brodkin's life. He mentioned that Brodkin was someone he considered a friend. In fact, they had a conversation just the evening before she passed away. Facing the court, Mustard declared, Though I might meet my end in prison, I'm not scared of death. I stand here innocent. After three long decades, justice finally caught up with Charles Mustard. For over 20 years, he wasn't even a blip on the police's radar, probably thinking he had evaded the law. But justice has a way of catching up. Rob Thomas, the officer who first arrived at the crime scene in 1993, played a pivotal role in the renewed investigation. Detective Sergeant Stacy Gallant recognized his dedication during the public announcement of the conviction. Zachary, a mere child of six when he discovered his mother's lifeless body, is now 36 with his own family. The trauma of that fateful day has left an indelible mark on him. In a heart-wrenching statement read out in court, Zachary, now known as Zachary Hefner, recounted the harrowing moment. The moment I entered that door is when my entire life changed, he expressed. Adding, it took my six-year-old mind several minutes to fully take in and understand the horror of what I was looking at. My mother was dead. Following the conviction, Herb Brodkin, Barbara's cousin, spoke on behalf of the family. He expressed his satisfaction with the verdict, stating, I thought it was a very well-reasoned verdict. I'm very proud of the judge for what he did. He thanked the Toronto police for their unwavering commitment to the case, bringing much-needed closure to the family. Herb also remarked on the rarity of solving such old cases, noting, Up until recently, I thought cold cases were just something that happened in a TV series in the States. On the 7th of October 1992, the residents of Tyne and Weir, Sunderland, England, awoke to the shocking revelation of the death of a seven-year-old English girl, Nikki Allen. The police were quickly alerted to the scene, where her body was found inside the basement of the building with 37 stab wounds, and her head had been bludgeoned by a brick. Who could have done this terrible, heinous act to a little girl? And what could have prompted such an act? Tyne and Weir, located in the northeast of England, is a metropolitan county with a rich history. Sunderland, one of its major cities, is a blend of modernity and heritage. Living in Sunderland offers a mix of recreational spots like parks and beaches, 
and historical landmarks that tell tales of its past. The people here are known for their warmth and community spirit. An important characteristic of Tyne and Weir is its maritime legacy, with the River Tyne playing a pivotal role in its development. While the region generally has a moderate crime rate, the tragic incident of Nicky Allen in 1992 remains an indelible mark on its history. Nicky Allen, born on August 30, 1985, in Sunderland, Northeast England, was the beloved daughter of Sharon Prest, now Sharon Henderson, and David Allen. Growing up in the Weir Garth block of flats which provided a scenic view of Sunderland's East End ports, Nikki shared her home with three sisters. Those close to her fondly remember her as a vibrant and spirited child. Like any other seven-year-old, Nikki relished her playtime with friends and cherished her toys. One of her endearing quirks was her fondness for cheese and onion crisps, a staple in her daily school lunch. The close-knit nature of her family was evident, as Nikki's maternal grandparents lived in the same building. They played a pivotal role in the children's upbringing, often assisting Sharon in caring for them. Sharon's dedication as a mother was evident. She prioritized her children's well-being above all else. For Nikki and her family, life was filled with simple joys. Yet unbeknownst to them, their world was about to change forever. On that fateful day of October 7, 1992, Nikki Allen's routine seemed like any other. The evening saw her engrossed in play with her cousin and older sister Stacy. As the sun began to set, Sharon, Nikki's mother, decided to step out for a bit. I'll be back in five minutes, she assured her daughters. Her destination was close, her father and stepmother's flat located within the same block. It wasn't long before the playful laughter of Nikki and her cousin echoed in the corridor following Sharon. Mom, can we visit the park tomorrow? Nikki's innocent voice inquired. Sharon, sensing the excitement in her daughter's voice, gently instructed Nikki to head home, reassuring her of a swift return. However, upon Sharon's return, the atmosphere in the Allen household had shifted from one of mirth to palpable tension. Stacy's voice, laced with concern, broke the silence. Mom, Nikki didn't come home. Panic set in. Sharon's voice echoed through the corridors, calling out for Nikki, her anxiety evident in every shout. But Nikki was nowhere to be found. In what felt like mere moments, Nikki Allen had seemingly vanished into thin air. The distance between Nikki's home and her grandparents' flat where she was last seen was a mere 150 yards. The brevity of this distance only deepened the mystery of her sudden disappearance. Within an hour, the police were alerted and arrived on the scene. The east end of Sunderland, though economically challenged and often overlooked, was home to a close-knit community. Here, neighbors were more like extended family, familiar with each other's routines and daily lives. Word of Nikki's disappearance spread rapidly, igniting a sense of urgency and unity among the residents. In no time, a search team was assembled, comprising over 100 police officers and community volunteers. Their mission was clear. Find Nikki. The search was extensive. Teams scoured parks, playgrounds, alleyways, industrial units, and even the waterfront where the River Weir meandered throughout the city. This river, known for its deceptive depth and treacherous undercurrents, added an element of dread to the search. As dawn broke the next day, a chilling discovery was made. The Quayside Exchange Building, long abandoned and in a state of disrepair, would become the epicenter of this tragic tale. 
Outside the building, a pair of shoes caught the attention of the search team led by Nikki's aunt. A sense of foreboding hung in the air as they ventured inside, only to be met with a sight that would haunt them forever. Nikki's lifeless body lay inside, bearing the severe marks of a heinous crime. She had been savagely attacked with a brick and had suffered over 37 stab wounds. The discovery sent shockwaves through the community. A place where everyone knew each other, where children played freely, was now overshadowed by a dark cloud of grief and fear. The quest for answers began, but the haunting question remained. Who could commit such a monstrous act against a young, innocent life? The immediate aftermath of Nikki Allen's tragic discovery saw the police diving deep into the investigation. Their first course of action was interviewing the locals, hoping to piece together Nikki's last movements on the night she vanished. As they delved into the accounts, inconsistencies began to emerge, particularly concerning the time Nikki left her grandparents' flat. While some mentioned 7.30 p.m., Others believed it was closer to 9.30 p.m., with a few suggesting even later. However, a common thread among most testimonies was that Nikki departed roughly 10 minutes before her mother. Several witnesses recalled seeing Nikki around 10 p.m. near the Boar's Head Pub, which was situated opposite her residence. She was engaging in the British bonfire night tradition of asking for a penny for the guy. Disturbingly, another witness reported hearing what sounded like a young girl's screams emanating from the direction of the Quayside Exchange building. A BBC Crime Watch reconstruction depicted a cheerful Nikki skipping past the pub. The footage suggested she was heading towards the dock alone, but she encountered a man at some point. This individual, dressed in a crisp white shirt, was seen walking ahead of Nikki, who playfully skipped behind him. The police managed to unearth CCTV footage that seemed to align with these witness accounts. Although the video quality was far from ideal, it gave a chilling glimpse of Nikki's final moments before her untimely death. As the interviews with the locals progressed, one name kept resurfacing. This individual was often referred to as the local weirdo and was known to frequent the Quayside Exchange building, the very place where Nikki's life was tragically cut short. Acting on this lead, the police made a significant move one week later, arresting 24-year-old George Heron in connection with Nikki Allen's murder. The community watched with bated breath, hoping justice would soon be served for the young girl whose life was taken too soon. In the latter part of 1993, the investigation spotlight turned to George Heron, a young man residing close to the Allen residence. Several pieces of evidence seemed to point towards Heron's involvement. A knife consistent with the wounds on Nikki was discovered in his living quarters. Also, traces of blood were detected on his shoes and attire. Adding to the suspicion, Heron's sister provided a curious account to the police. On the night of the murder, she recalled, Heron had unusually spent an extended time in the bathroom, presumably washing himself and his clothes. This behavior was out of character for him. Despite these mounting pieces of evidence, Heron staunchly denied any involvement. He claimed he hadn't ventured out on the evening Nikki was murdered. However, this statement was contradicted by four witnesses who reported seeing a man resembling Heron at two local pubs, the Boar's Head and the Clarendon. Intriguingly, he was observed purchasing cheese and onion crisps, Nikki's favorite snack. The police theorized that Heron might have used these crisps to entice Nikki into the building. After enduring three days of rigorous questioning, 
Heron's defenses seem to crumble, leading him to confess to the crime. It's worth noting that prior to this admission, he had denied the allegations a staggering 120 times. The evidence, albeit circumstantial, appeared strong, and the police were confident of securing a conviction. The Leeds Crown Court became the stage for his trial, where he faced charges for Nikki Allen's murder. However, the case took an unexpected turn. The judge deemed Heron's taped confession inadmissible, citing heavy-handed police tactics as the reason. Consequently, the case against Heron unraveled, and he was acquitted of all charges related to Nikki Allen's murder. Following the trial, Heron was provided a new identity and relocated away from Sunderland for his safety. In a twist of events in 1994, Sharon Henderson, Nikki's mother, pursued a civil case against Heron. She accused him of battery on a child, resulting in her death. The court ruled in Henderson's favor, ordering Heron to compensate her with over 7,000 pounds. However, Heron's whereabouts became elusive, ensuring that the ordered amount remained unpaid. The quest for justice for Nikki Allen continued, with more questions than answers. Years after Nikki Allen's tragic death, the quest for justice remained relentless. In February 2014, a new twist emerged when Steve Grievison, a known serial killer serving time, was arrested in connection with Nikki's murder. However, after thorough questioning, he was informed that he wouldn't face any further action regarding the case. Fast forward to May 2016, a glimmer of hope appeared. A woman whose name was kept anonymous to the public approached Sharon Henderson, claiming to possess previously undisclosed information about Nikki's murder. This individual, who was merely 12 years old at the time of the crime, and had been babysitting in the vicinity of Nikki's disappearance, decided to break her silence and spoke to the police. Spurred by this new lead, Henderson, in September of that same year, passionately advocated for a comprehensive reinvestigation into her daughter's murder. She initiated an online petition, urging the Northumbria police to thoroughly review the entire case. The community's support was overwhelming, with a petition amassing over 500 signatures in less than a day. In a bid to leave no stone unturned, Henderson reached out to Grievison the following month, imploring him to divulge any knowledge he might have concerning Nikki's death. By April 2017, Henderson's persistent efforts led her to a meeting with Northumbria Police Chief Constable Steve Ashman and Detective Chief Inspector Lisa Thaker. Both officials reaffirmed their unwavering commitment to ensuring justice for Nikki. October 2017 marked a significant breakthrough. The police announced that they had successfully extracted a DNA sample from an unidentified male, potentially linked to the crime. This development rekindled hope for a resolution. Then, in April 2018, the investigation took a decisive turn. Northumbria police executed a raid on a residence in the Stockton area of Teesside, resulting in the arrest of a suspect in connection with Nikki Allen's murder. Four years later, in 2022, the individual arrested was formally charged with the heinous crime. He was identified as 54-year-old David Thomas Boyd. David Thomas Boyd, originally born as David Thomas Bell on the 1st of June 1967 in London, had a childhood marked by constant movement, largely due to his father's service in the forces. By the time he settled in Sunderland, he had no nearby family ties. 
This detachment perhaps contributed to his inclination to change his identity frequently. Over the years, he adopted various names, including Jason Branson, John Eastman, and David Thomas Smith. In 1986, a dark side of Boyd emerged when he was convicted for breach of the peace. This conviction stemmed from an unsettling incident where he approached an underage girl seeking a kiss. His subsequent conversations with the probation officer revealed even more disturbing fantasies about young girls. Boyd's proximity to Nikki Allen's family was uncomfortably close. He resided in Weir Garth on the same floor as Nikki's grandparents. He wasn't just a distant neighbor. He was deeply intertwined with the family. His girlfriend at the time served as Nikki's babysitter. This closeness, however, didn't deter him from his dark tendencies. When Nikki's case first broke, Boyd was among those questioned by the police. But with a fabricated alibi, he managed to divert suspicion. Over the subsequent years, perhaps sensing the net closing in or driven by guilt, Boyd frequently changed his name, a desperate attempt to escape the looming shadow of justice. David Thomas Boyd's trial commenced on the 20th of April, 2023, at Newcastle Crown Court. The prosecution painted a chilling picture, suggesting that Boyd had enticed young Nikki Allen to a desolate area near the River Weir. There, it was believed she suffered a blow to the head, causing her to bleed. A witness recalled seeing Nikki not in distress, but skipping to keep pace with a man. The narrative continued with the prosecution stating that Boyd had forced Nikki into the derelict old exchange building. Inside, the unexpected occurrence escalated. Nikki was beaten with a brick and her skull fractured. The violence didn't end there. She was stabbed multiple times, targeting her chest, heart, and lungs. The post-mortem results indicated that the initial blow likely rendered Nikki unconscious before the stabbing ensued. A chilling testimony from a witness pinpointed the time of the crime, recalling a scream around 10 p.m. on the 6th of October. The trial revealed that Boyd was known by different names and was 25 years old during this heinous act. The evidence against him was described as circumstantial but compelling. Boyd's DNA was found on Nikki's clothing. In a bizarre defense, Boyd claimed that Nikki might have come into contact with his saliva after spatting from his balcony. He also mentioned his familiarity with the old exchange building, having entered it days before with a boy searching for pigeons. The defense argued that the evidence was merely a series of innocent coincidences. Mrs. Justice Christina Lambert reminded the jury of the circumstantial nature of the evidence and highlighted the absence of direct proof implicating Boyd. Interestingly, Boyd chose not to testify during the trial. On the 12th of May, 2023, after two and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found Boyd guilty of Nikki Allen's murder. The long-awaited verdict brought some semblance of closure to Nikki's family. Nikki's mother, Henderson, expressed her sentiments to BBC News, reflecting on the agonizing 30-year quest for justice. The final chapter of this tragic tale was written on the 23rd of May, 2023, when Boyd received a life sentence with a stipulation, he would serve a minimum of 29 years before being considered for parole. This means Boyd's earliest chance at freedom would be in August of 2049. 
The conclusion of the Nikki Allen case brought a whirlwind of emotion for those involved. Sharon Henderson, Nikki's mother, at 57, voiced her profound disappointment with the sentencing of David Boyd. She believed the verdict was a disgrace and felt that Boyd should never have the chance for parole. This is the recurring narrative for families like mine. Injustice, Sharon lamented. Sharon, who was only 25 when her daughter was tragically taken from her, remembered Nikki as an energetic child with a radiant smile. The community's misplaced anger weighed heavily on her, as many wrongfully accused her of being a neglectful mother, directing their ire towards her instead of the actual perpetrator. Boyd's actions shattered her family, but Sharon's resilience shone through as she tirelessly sought justice for her daughter. The journey was fraught with challenges, including her own arrest, stemming from her accusations against those she believed were shielding the guilty. David Allen, Nikki's father, was 28 at the time of the tragedy. He expressed that his life took a dark turn from that fateful night. The pain and anger he felt towards Boyd were palpable. The anguish is indescribable, he said, emphasizing the stark contrast between Boyd's continued existence and Nikki's life, which was cut short. In a surprising turn of events, Northumbria police apologized to George Heron, who was initially implicated in the case. Heron's response was a mix of sadness, disgust, and anger, particularly towards the original investigators whom he felt had betrayed him. The 1992 investigation was riddled with errors, as Prosecutor Richard Wright K.C. pointed out. However, the team that revisited the case approached it with fresh eyes, making no assumptions. Their meticulous efforts included collecting DNA samples from over 800 men nationwide, recording 1,200 statements, and producing 2,500 documents. The judge lauded their Herculean efforts, emphasizing the pivotal role of the DNA evidence in securing Boyd's conviction. Consider a tiny village in the summer of 1980, when the sound of children's laughter filled the air, and life appeared to be unaffected by the darkness. But in the heart of this tiny community, Mishawaka, a terrifying tragedy occurred that would haunt its citizens for the rest of their lives. Shelley Ann Werner, a 15-year-old girl, vanished without a trace on June 15, 1980, leaving her family devastated. Her lifeless body was discovered ten excruciating days later, with a gunshot wound to her head, near the barren train tracks on Madison Road. How could such a horrific crime have happened in broad sunlight? Who could be the perpetrator of this heinous crime? Mishawaka, located in northern Indiana, is a flourishing commercial city with its own distinct charm. Its lovely location along the St. Joseph River in Penn Township, St. Joseph County, provides a picturesque backdrop to everyday living. With a population of roughly 51,000 people, the city proudly carries the name The Princess City. Mishawaka is a mix of traditional communities and new residential subdivisions that have been carefully planned to generate a strong sense of community and connection. Residents are noted for their friendliness, kindness, and a common love of adventure, and the community spirit thrives here. Even in this close-knit community, a horrifying crime occurred that destroyed Mishawaka's serenity, forever engraving its name in the annals of tragedy. Shelley Ann Werner was born on the 4th of July, 1964, and her early life is shrouded in mystery. She shared a home in Mishawaka, Indiana with her mother, Kathleen Werner. 
Shelley's parents had divorced, putting her in the care of her mother. Her mother was a teacher at an elementary school near their residence. At the young age of 15, Shelley was a student at Mishawaka High School, where she participated in sports and sang in the school band. She wasn't dating anyone and was not known to have any enemies. Shelley was a bright and hopeful young lady with a bright future ahead of her, eager to pursue her aspirations. Shelley's present was filled with the vitality of youth, bubbling with enthusiasm for life's possibilities. She had no idea that fate had an unexpected and devastating twist in store for her. On June 16, 1980, Mishawaka's calm routine was disturbed by an occurrence that would leave the community scarred for life. Shelley Ann Werner, a 15-year-old Mishawaka high school student, set out on what should have been a routine day. She gave her mother Kathleen a joyful farewell. Her destination? Wilt's Supermarket, a short two-mile drive away in her trusty 1973 Volkswagen. An unsettling silence surrounded the Warner home as the clock ticked away. An hour passed, and Shelley didn't return back home. Soon, Kathleen began to panic, and anxiety turned to dread. The minutes went into hours, and Shelley was still not at their door. Kathleen waited and waited until her desperation caused her to inform the authorities. Her voice trembled as she reported her daughter's absence to the authorities. The Mishawaka Police Department initially viewed the case as one of a missing person, suspecting a teenage runaway. But as time passed, a terrifying conclusion sank in. Shelley had not returned even after 24 torturous hours. With rising concern, investigators quickly changed the investigation status to suspected abduction. There were no obvious indicators of foul play in those early hours of despair, leaving detectives perplexed. Kathleen's initial call was submitted as a routine missing persons report, but the next day offered no relief. The gloomy shades of uncertainty had settled over Mishawaka, laying the groundwork for a haunting mystery that would last for decades. The authorities immediately began an investigation, and soon they learned that Shelley had arrived at Wilt Supermarket on the 16th of June 1980 and was seen buying groceries at about 1.30 p.m. She bought groceries then at around 2 p.m., she was seen leaving the supermarket and headed towards her car, which was parked approximately 50 feet from the store's entrance. However, as soon as she got into her car, things started to take a wrong turn. A man with blonde hair, around 16 to 18 years old, 5 foot 7 inches tall, and roughly around 130 pounds, was seen prowling around the store, according to eyewitnesses. He approached Shelley's car, and to everyone's surprise, took the wheel, pushing Shelley into the passenger seat. Witnesses described her as surprised during the terrifying episode. However, the man's back was turned to the eyewitnesses, making it difficult to tell whether Shelley was in danger or if a weapon was involved. He took the wheel and the two of them drove away together. It was shocking and intimidating conduct that perplexed observers. Concerned family and friends launched a large-scale group search in the hope of finding any evidence of the missing teenager. In order to elicit information from the public, authorities issued a sketch of the first suspect based on the witness's description. A tragic discovery a few hours later added to the intrigue. Shelley's car was discovered abandoned in a parking shop parking facility in neighboring Osceola, Indiana. 
there were no traces of a struggle inside the vehicle. But Shelley was nowhere to be found. The search for answers continued as investigators attempted to determine what had occurred. After ten excruciating days, two teenage girls exploring a forested area outside South Bend, Indiana, came across a horrible sight. A young woman's partially naked body lay in a ditch beside the railroad lines. Who could it have been? It was no other than Shelley Werner. Her identification was confirmed by dental records. Her body's location showed she was murdered there, shot twice at close range with a big caliber gun, one to the left side of her skull and another to her body. The investigation was a roller coaster ride of leads and setbacks. In their desperate search for answers, the cops turned to an uncommon method hypnosis. Four grocery store witnesses underwent hypnosis in the hopes of recalling vital details concerning Shelley's abduction. These sessions resulted in a fresh sketch of the first suspect, which revealed that he had been dropped off at the store and appeared to be a hitchhiker. Shelley was reportedly seen talking to two young women before entering the store, according to the witnesses. But no one knew who those two women were, or if they had anything to do with Shelley's abduction. Despite all these efforts of the law enforcement, the culprit eluded capture. Several males matching the description were brought in by police, but a lineup failed to identify any of them as the abductor. The man who dropped off the suspect and the two young women Shelley had spoken with remained unidentified, frustrating authorities and leaving the case unresolved. The leads decreased over time, and the investigation came to a halt. Shelley's murder had long perplexed authorities. She appeared to be an ordinary high school junior, and the motive for her death remained a mystery. Witnesses characterized Shelley as surprised when the man entered her vehicle, which was a peculiar detail. It gave detectives a disturbing possibility that she knew her killer or killers. But the abduction and murder of Shelley Werner soon became a cold case, a frightening mystery that cast a shadow over Mishawaka for far too long. Initially, the case was handled by the St. Joseph County Metro Homicide Unit. When the unit was disbanded in late 2021, the Mishawaka Police Department's cold case team took over, seeking to solve the mystery that had plagued them for years. With time rolling by, the unsolved murder of Shelley Ann Werner had thrown a long shadow. But after 43 years in April of 2023, a critical witness surfaced, revealing new light on the terrifying case, like a glimmer of hope breaking through the gloom. This witness, a woman who had remained silent for fear of her family's safety, had the fortitude to finally speak up. James Campbell, one of the investigators who worked relentlessly with David Dosman, Tim Corbett, Sam Walsh, and Donna Newcomer to find the answers, stated that the suspects had intimidated this witness. The witness's revelation was a watershed moment. She identified three people who were involved in Shelley's murder. However, their names were kept private by the authorities. Surprisingly, it was found out that Shelley wasn't entirely familiar with these men. They were older than her, and she probably only knew their family. But the police still haven't shared why she was hurt or who was involved. Two of the suspects had died over the years. One died in 2001, and the second in 2010. And the third had vanished into the shadows, a fact previously unknown to detectives. 
The inquiry into Shelley's kidnapping and murder was reopened as a result of this new information. Detectives dug into the three men's histories and discovered a terrible history of violence, lending credence to the initial witness's statement. It seemed that these men were personally responsible for Shelley's terrible death. The police came to know that only after two of the accused had died did the witness feel comfortable enough to talk with the police. In January of 2022, the Mishawaka Police Department established a cold case unit made up of former South Bend murder investigators tasked with investigating unsolved homicide cases like Shelley's. This crew worked tirelessly, identifying new witnesses and uncovering further evidence that corroborated the initial witness's story. However, as they dug more, they learned that the third suspect died in 2018. The identification of three men as being engaged in Shelley's kidnapping and murder was a significant development. It demonstrated the impact of a witness's bravery in coming forward more than four decades after the horrible incident. The witness was motivated by the knowledge that two of the suspects had met their deaths and the third had disappeared. Fear and intimidation wielded by these suspects over the years had kept vital facts secret for so long, exacerbating Shelley's family and the community's agony. Cold case investigator James Campbell described the difficulties witnesses encountered, emphasizing how threats to their families had muffled their voices. Although the evidence and testimony gathered by investigators gave a clear picture of the three suspects' involvement, there was a grave issue that couldn't be ignored. All the three suspects were deceased, so how could the investigators proceed further and provide justice to Shelley's family? The St. Joseph County Prosecutor's Office analyzed the evidence and concluded it to be conclusive, thereby closing the case. It became clear that justice in the form of legal repercussions could not be administered against the deceased. While specifics regarding the suspects remained limited, except for their age, proximity to Shelley, and her familiarity with them, the St. Joseph County Prosecutor's Office decision provided finality. Despite the deaths of the suspects, the hope was that Shelley's family might finally find some peace, knowing that the truth had been revealed. The witness's vital information triggered a chain reaction, resulting in more evidence and additional witnesses. Although DNA research could not give a definite match, other evidence and statements, according to the St. Joseph County Prosecutor's Office, were crucial. This heinous crime appears to have been planned by people Werner had just a passing acquaintance with. Unfortunately, due to their death, the suspect's names remain unknown, preventing any charges from being filed. In the end, the passage of time had not dimmed the resolve of those dedicated to achieving justice. The murder of Shelley Ann Werner had been solved thanks to the perseverance of investigators and the bravery of a witness who broke her silence to shed light on a sad chapter in Mishawaka's history. The outcome of Shelley Ann Werner's case ignited a range of emotions from people who were personally involved in the case. Detectives who had worked relentlessly for years to find answers took some solace in the case's closure. Tim Corbett, one of the cold case investigators, expressed, I hope she's sitting next to God, thanking police, citizens, anyone who helped us. Nonetheless, there was a lingering grief during the shutdown. The members of the family, naturally reserved in their grief, did not respond to the updates.
being struck by a, a blunt object in the back of the head. In the small town of Independence, Louisiana, a shocking event occurred on July 23, 2010. Jameen Robinson, just 21 years old, was found unconscious in a ditch near his home by a passerby. He was suffering from critical injuries, but there were no open wounds or blood at the scene. He was rushed to Lally Kemp Regional Medical Center, then transferred to St. Tammany Medical Center for surgery, and later on to New Orleans University Hospital. But sadly, he didn't make it. What happened on that fateful night? And what circumstances led to such a devastating end? Independence, Louisiana, once known as Uncle Sam, is a town in Tangapoa Parish with a population of 1,635 as of 2020. It's a part of the Hammond Micropolitan Statistical Area. The town has a rich history, with its establishment as a town being led by the state representative, Harry D. Wilson, in the early 20th century. Independence boasts a strong Italian-American community, celebrating its Sicilian heritage with a festival every March. Living here, one can feel the blend of cultures and the pride of its residents. However, despite its peaceful demeanor, the town isn't immune to crime. And it's here that our story takes us today. Jameen Robinson, born March 31, 1989, in Independence, Louisiana, was a beacon of joy in his community. While many details of his early life including his parents' names, remain unknown, his bond with his sister, Chastity Jackson, was undeniable. They grew up together, leaning on each other for support and love. Jameen's infectious smile and warm heart left an indelible mark on everyone he met. Beyond his kind nature, he was a talented artist, capturing the world's essence through his sketches. He was also deeply involved in his church, often volunteering to help those less fortunate. Among his close-knit circle was Montre Trevel Page, a younger friend from the same neighborhood and school in Independence. Their friendship was a testament to Jameen's ability to connect with people of all ages. With dreams and aspirations, Jameen's future seemed bright. But in a twist of fate, the joyous days were abruptly halted. On July 23, 2010, Jameen Robinson began his day in Independence, Louisiana, just like any other. He woke up, went about his usual tasks, and ran his errands, completely unaware that this day would be unlike any other. As the sun began to set, Jameen's day took a tragic turn. Minutes before 11 p.m., the Independence Police Department received an urgent call. The voice on the other end, filled with panic, reported an unconscious individual on Chemistry Street near a roadside ditch. The police, sensing the gravity of the situation, sped to the location. What they found was heart-wrenching. A young man, motionless, with no visible injuries but clearly in distress. The immediate suspicion was a hit and run, given the absence of any other evidence at the scene. Every second counted. Paramedics, with the help of the police, swiftly moved the young man to an ambulance. Sirens blaring, heading straight for Lally Kemp Regional Medical Center. Upon arrival, the medical team worked diligently, stabilizing him and assessing the severity of his injuries. The prognosis was grim. Multiple head injuries meant his life was hanging by the thinnest of threads. To provide him with the best possible care, Jameen was transferred to St. Tammany Medical Center, a renowned facility in the state. As medical professionals worked around the clock, more details about the victim emerged. 
He was Jameen Robinson. His family, upon hearing the news, rushed to the bed by his side, their hearts heavy with dread. They held on to hope, praying for a miracle. But as hours turned into days, their optimism waned. Despite the successful surgery, Jameen's recovery was slow, and his condition worsened. In a bid to provide even better care, he was moved to New Orleans University Hospital. However, on July 25, 2010, just two days after the incident, the unimaginable happened. Jameen Robinson passed away. The grief that enveloped his family was palpable. The suddenness of his departure, the unanswered questions, the void he left behind. It was all too much to bear. The following day, an autopsy was scheduled at the Tangapoa Parish Coroner's Office. The findings were startling. Jameen's death was due to internal closed head injuries. Interestingly, the nature of the injuries indicated that if a vehicle was involved, It was moving slowly. This revelation deepened the mystery surrounding that night. Word of Jameen's tragic end rapidly spread, casting a somber shadow over independence. The town known for its tranquility and close-knit community was now grappling with a tragedy that left more questions than answers. The quest to uncover the truth about Jameen Robinson's last moments became a focal point, not just for his grieving family, but for an entire community seeking closure. The Independence Police Department immediately launched an exhaustive investigation into Jameen Robinson's tragic end. Their mission was clear, to uncover the truth behind the events of that night. The weight of the task was immense, with a myriad of questions looming. Was it a hit and run? If not, what could have possibly led to Jameen's condition? In the midst of their inquiries, detectives stumbled upon a significant lead. The individual who had discovered Jameen by the roadside was none other than Montre Trevel Page, his close friend and neighbor. This revelation shifted the focus of the investigation. Montre's account of that night could potentially be the key to unlocking the mystery. However, after extensive questioning of Montre, the pieces of the puzzle remained scattered as they couldn't get any closer to a resolution. The town mourned as Jameen was laid to rest. The funeral was a sad gathering with attendees reflecting on the memories they had shared with the young man. His infectious smile, his artistic talents, and his unwavering kindness were reminisced upon by many who had been touched by his presence. Post the funeral, the detectives with renewed determination continued their quest for answers. They expanded their scope, interviewing a plethora of individuals who might have had even the slightest interaction with Jameen on that day. The community was urged to come forward with any information, no matter how trivial it might seem. The hope was that someone, somewhere, had seen or heard something that could provide a breakthrough. Yet, as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, The pain of Jameen's loss remained as raw as ever for his family and friends. Each year on the anniversary of his passing, the wound was reopened. The quest for justice, as fervent as ever. The community's collective heartache was palpable, with the unsolved nature of the case adding to their distress. Despite the relentless efforts of the authorities, The leads were sparse. The trail seemed to grow colder with each passing day. Theories were proposed, leads were followed, but the elusive truth remained just out of reach. The case, with its myriad of unanswered questions, eventually went cold. 
In 2017, seven years after Jameen's death, a glimmer of hope emerged for his case. The Independence Police Department, recognizing the need for fresh eyes and expertise, sought assistance from the Tangapoa Sheriff's Office. This collaboration marked a renewed effort to uncover the truth. Detective Mike Sticker, known for his tenacity, took the reins of the investigation. Working closely with Independence Police Chief Frank Edwards, they spearheaded a team of dedicated detectives. Together, they delved deep into the case files, re-examining every detail, every lead, and every piece of evidence. Their belief was unwavering. Somewhere within the community lay the key to unlocking the mystery. Understanding the power of collective memory, they once again reached out to the public. Chief Frank Edwards was particularly optimistic that renewed media attention might be the catalyst needed. He hoped that revisiting the case in the public eye might stir a memory, a detail previously overlooked, or even prompt someone wrestling with their conscience to step forward. The journey was arduous, but the team's resolve never wavered. They were driven by a singular goal, to bring justice to Jameen and provide closure to his family. The community, too, rallied behind these efforts, hoping that this renewed investigation would finally shed light on the events of that tragic night. In January 2023, a pivotal moment arrived in Jameen Robinson's case. A witness choosing to remain anonymous, stepped forward. This individual, burdened by guilt, shared a revelation that would reshape the entire narrative of the investigation. Contrary to the initial belief that Jameen's death resulted from a hit and run, the witness pointed towards someone much closer to Jameen, his friend, Montre Trevel Page. This revelation was staggering. The details provided by the witness, though not fully disclosed to the public, painted Montre in a new, unsettling light. Acting on this newfound information, detectives swiftly initiated a search for Montre, tracing him to Chambers County, Texas. On February 10, 2023, the long arm of the law finally caught up with him, leading to his arrest. The pieces of the puzzle were finally coming together, shedding light on a tale of betrayal and evasion. The community, while shocked, hoped that justice would finally be served for Jameen. Montre Trevel Page, born in September 1992, now 30, had a history as intricate as it is troubling. Residing at 43353 Happy Woods Road, Unit 14, Hammond, Louisiana, Montre settled there around February of 2012. A construction worker by trade, his life in Hammond was punctuated by frequent moves to and from Texas, as noted by Jameen Robinson's sister, Chastity Jackson. She also hinted at Montre's possible criminal involvements in Texas. But Montre's story isn't just one of crime. In 2008, a young 15-year-old Montre showcased a different side, volunteering at the Summer Safety Crime Prevention Retreat in Independence's Fontana Road Park. He was eager to help, setting up campsites and being part of a community initiative. However, just two years later, in 2010, Montre's name would resurface under different circumstances. He was the one who reported finding Jameen unconscious near a roadside ditch. Delving deeper into Montre's past revealed a pattern of legal infractions. In November 2021, he had been arrested on multiple drug charges. Following his arrest, the court mandated him to wear an ankle monitor and scheduled a sentencing hearing for November 19th. But Montre, in a bid to evade the law, fled to Texas, 
removing his ankle monitor in the process. While his early years hinted at a promising future, Montre's later involvements in drug-related activities and illegal possession of weapons tied to violent crimes painted a contrasting picture. This duality in Montre's character, from a helpful teenager to a man with a criminal record, adds layers to the narrative, making one wonder about the turns his life took and the choices he made. Interestingly, Montre's age at the time of Jamin's death, 17, posed a legal dilemma. However, as Sheriff Tammy Travis of Tangapoa clarified, in Louisiana, a 17-year-old was deemed an adult offender up until three years prior. Consequently, Montre faced charges as an adult, including second-degree murder, multiple counts of failure to appear, and one count of jumping bail. The revelation of Montre's involvement in Jamin's death sent ripples throughout the community. For Jamin's family, the news was a double-edged sword. Disbelief that a friend could commit such an act, yet relief that the mystery was finally solved. The community grappled with the unsettling truth, struggling with the betrayal and the tragedy of a friendship gone awry. On February 27, 2023, Montre faced the consequences of his actions. He pleaded guilty to multiple drug-related charges and received a 90-year prison sentence. In the end, the tireless efforts of law enforcement, coupled with the courage of a key witness, brought clarity to Jameen's case. While the pain of loss remains, Jameen's family and the community can now find some semblance of closure and embark on a journey of healing and recovery. (laughs) 